sesiunea a doua zilei de inovație. Sunt Gabriel Bărlică, redactor șef ajung de la revista Biz. Și avem un panel axat pe startup-uri. Îți vedea lucruri, zic eu, foarte interesante. Idei românești, în zona de startup, de tehnologie. Dar mai întâi, avem onoarea să-l avem ca keynote speaker, pe Benjamin Rope, investor în CEO la Mass Angel Fund, omul cu banii, the man with the money, Benjamin Rope, is uh, looking for startups to invest in. He works with big names like Deutsche Bank, looking for interesting investments. So Benjamin, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I didn't understand uh, anything he said in the, in the beginning, but I hope it's true. So uh, I'm very pleased to be here. It's my first, first time in Romania and Bucharest uh, overall. And uh, before I get started, I really would like to uh, know a little bit more about the, the audience. So who of you has started a business already? And who of you thinks about starting a business? That should be the rest, basically, I hope. Um, and who works for big corporates? All right, I see some of the hands that said they want to start a business were also the ones who raised their hands starting working for big corporates, uh, which is a very good, uh, good point to start. So um, I, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, failure because I think it's a very important part of starting a business and becoming successful, successful in life. And to do so, I have put together a couple of stories out of my own personal life, as well as from other entrepreneurs that I, uh, that I know, um, and also the conclusion uh, that, I, that I took out of, uh, out of these lessons uh, that I've learned. So my opening slide that everyone probably has uh, read, read by now is a very simple thing uh, to say, obviously, but it's very difficult to, to apply. So let me introduce, introduce myself a little bit. I was born in Germany. Um, I was born in 1981. Uh, uh, I'm a very big soccer fan, so uh, the number one topic you should talk with me about, and you can ask Tagos over there, uh, it's, always, uh, it's always soccer. Um, which is very unfortunate because it's a very small team of my hometown called Kaiserslautern, and they do terribly bad over the last years. So this is really, when I want to feel pain, I watch soccer. Um, I started very early, so I got my first computer when I was nine and sort of from the very beginning tried to understand how this whole thing works. And um, that took me a couple of years until I had the very uh, great moment where a friend of mine borrowed me a modem for a dial-up connection to use, um, to use the internet. And this is basically how Yahoo looked back then. Um, and that was probably the best designed website out there at the time. Um, and two years later, by coincidence, so when I was the first time online, my first weekend, I think I didn't sleep at all. My parents were on travel. Uh, they returned on a Sunday night. They found me totally tired sitting in the living room in front of a computer screen because the wire wasn't long enough from the telephone for the modem connection. So I was sitting there from Friday afternoon until Sunday night, um, being online, trying to figure out how this whole thing works. And a couple of months later, um, a friend of mine who did a uh, uh, new job that he started in an advertising agency, so at this time I was, I was 15, so he started working in an advertising agency when he was 17 after he graduated from school. And he was calling me one evening like, yeah, you know what, we have this one client, they were talking about a website, and I know you're playing around with that stuff. Uh, could you maybe give us a hand and try to set the whole thing up? I was like, I've never done this before, but uh, it couldn't be that difficult. So um, we started to play around, around with that, and that apparently worked out, worked out very well. So a year later, after that, I decided to do what I did for that specific agency, um, to do that also for other advertising agencies. So my company um, that I started when I was 17 became sort of an outsourced department for digital publishing for a lot of uh, uh, small and medium-sized uh, 
uh, agencies um, around Germany. And starting with 17 in, in Germany, as you probably know, I think we are the most bureaucratic country in the, in the world. So uh, from a tax perspective, I can tell you that 80% of the literature worldwide published in uh, tax laws is written in German. So that probably gives you a very good overview how bureaucratic uh, uh, Germany works in general. So I had to speak in front of the court when I was 17 why I wanted to start a business uh, because society is responsible for my actions and um, <clears throat> I should uh, explain to them why exactly I want to uh, start a business and so they can judge if the risk society has to take to put me into such a position is applicable. So the uh, woman who was writing the notes of the, conference, uh, of the, of the meeting at the courthouse she was still having this really old typewriter, like, and uh, I was, the judge was telling me, like, yeah, but if you want to do something with technology and computers, you need to rent these large warehouses where you have to put in all this technology. And I stood up and like, really, I mean, understanding how you still work, having this typewriter up there, I can really understand that you have this 10 year old perspective on technology. But in today's time, you have a computer that you put up on your desk, and that's basically everything, uh, everything you need. So finally, in the end, they um, approved my little endeavor of starting this, 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 own, this own agency. Um, and at that time, I was still going to school. So uh, being in school, starting, starting my own business, um, I took a very individual way through different kinds of schools that I interrupted, joined another school, interrupted, joined another school. At my late last school, before I started my business, um, and what, after I started my business, I was probably one out of five days in school, and the rest of the time I was busy with my, my, my business. But I had the great fortune that the, uh, uh, the dean of the school uh, and my class teacher, they were always very understanding of, uh, of that. And when I told them, look guys, I really going out, starting a business, um, highly dedicated to it. I said, okay, look, school should prepare you for life, it shouldn't keep you away from life. So what we do is, uh, we send you off from school for one year, you try what you want to do, and if it works, it's great. If it doesn't work, you come back and finish your school. And this is how I started. So I always worked after that, like 24 seven, even though when I took on a vacation, and back in 1998, 1999, that wasn't really that simple to be online uh, wherever wherever you wanted to be online. But in the year 2000, I mean, there was a great gold rush coming along. So everybody wants to uh, start a technology company, um, start a business uh, going, going public. So we also had found, fortunately, a very well working uh, uh, business uh, that we've been working on. And we grew the company uh, very, uh, very fast. So we were running different verticals online um, in very, very special interest uh, fields and um, our core business was selling advertising. And that's something we really run into totally coincidentally. So uh, out of my personal passion when I had my agency, uh, I started a website uh, which was the very first one in Germany where you were able to uh, send and receive um, uh, faxes, you had a free email account and you were able to send free text messages. So in today's world, you would call this a unified messaging pl platform or service, but it wasn't there at the, uh, at the time. And um, I just had that idea and I approached a guy, uh, several guys that I would thought that could provide me the infrastructure and only one of them uh, responded to my emails that I was sending out because probably my email didn't have a business proposition. So I was just telling everyone, this is a great idea, we really have to do this, please help me. Only one guy uh, responded, luckily one guy responded. So I started a, a company with, with him and after a while we became very successful with that uh, one page. And we had in Germany right, 60,000 people using the service and in a time where we had less than 4 million people somehow having access to the internet that was really, really, really successful. So the agency uh, approached me one day and asked me uh, if they could put advertising on our website. And I was like, oh, advertising, that's an interesting thought. I haven't thought about that, but let's give it a try. And um, we started selling advertising on it. And 
I was still basically at that moment at, uh, at school, but a few weeks after that, if you convert it now to euros, we made something between five and 10,000 euros a week, and I worked two hours a day uh, on the business, and that was basically the point in time where I said, okay, I quit school, because if I do this in two hours a day, what can I do when I work 12 hours a day? Uh, so we have to put more energy into it. So we started very, very small, and um, this is essentially how our startup office looked like. It was a basement um, of my friend's place that I started a business with, and this was already the office of a company where we were in the process of preparing for an IPO, um, and this was basically. This was our server farm, also in that little, very little basement. Um, pay attention to the little details. Maybe see the orange window. We painted orange, so our company's color was orange and blue. Uh, we tried to have it a little bit, a little bit nice in our small basement. And for the first six months, I slept on a field bed of the military in the shower in the basement. Um, to compensate all of that, we obviously. Uh, uh, joined a lot of uh, uh, big parties, so this was during CBIT. Um, I don't know, whoever heard about CBIT? The world's largest tech internet software conference in, uh, in Germany, in Hanover, every year. Um, we made so much money that our interns, doing an internship in our company, we basically gave company cars, because we didn't really know what to do with our money. Our CTO was able to buy big servers any given month he really, want, he really wanted to. And we eventually were on our way to, uh, to go public. So we had it almost all. We had like our company cars branded with our company name and uh, we were profitable. We never raised money from anyone else. Um, so we were free to do whatever we want. In the time of our IPO plans, we looked up private islands for sale and filled out ordering forms for yellow and black Ferraris, uh, uh, which was a bit, uh, a bit crazy. And then um, uh, this little time came, uh, came along. Um, everything went to hell. So all our clients that were advertising with us, they were venture capital funded. Venture capital funds stopped invested into the companies, which eventually meant that even us, not directly depending on venture capital, but indirectly depending on venture capital, had like a drop of revenue around 90% within a week. So <clears throat> the, hardest, the hardest lesson that we've learned pretty quickly was that money is not an unlimited resource and uh, we had to reinvest everything that we, that we saved back into, the, uh, back into the company. So since we were so profitable, we took out um, money to our private accounts every month and we just like reverted all of this uh, within within the same within the same same month of the company. Eventually, we, we put the money into uh, the company into a completely different business and really scaled everything down. And it seemed to still work. So, but at one point, it was not enough to make money making enough money to pay all of us. So, I finally set set a date for myself where I'd like to leave the company and do something else, which was essentially uh, at a certain certain given time. So I would uh, consider myself a bubble survivor because I went through this whole thing. Um, I didn't I didn't lose much because I didn't have to go into debt, but I didn't have anything after it. So I had to sell my car, I had no more cash, I had to move back into my parents' place, I had to quit my own apartment. Um, but uh, I still was that free, and I think I pretty much learned a lot in the decent age of, I think, 20, 21, um, to have hired a lot of people, preparing the company for the IPO, scaling the whole technology, the whole business. Most of the infrastructure that we were developing software-wise uh, was developed, uh, developed by me, and I would call this the real-life MBA. Um, uh, given to you by the University of Hot Knox. Um, so living back in my parents' place, 
Um, I thought about something, so when I said earlier that I dropped out of a couple of schools and tried to do different things, so I went two years on a specialized school for electrical engineering, and my father used to work in a big energy company for a couple of years. So in this time, around 2000s, 2001, 2002, solar energy has become something really popular in, in Germany. And so we started to set up a business where we sell end-to-end -end solutions for private households in the solar energy business. So we help them from uh, calculating their returns to finding the architects and the people who plan everything to put it on the roof, all the way to connecting it to the grid and filling out the forms where you put your electricity into, your, into the grid of your local energy supplier and getting, uh, getting money out of that. And my very first client was my elementary school. So here on the left side, you see the principal and the teacher that I still used, used to go to, and on the far right side, yes, that's me. Um, uh, feels like 30 years ago, but it's not that long ago. Um, but this was something really very simple to do. We set that whole thing up. It was a couple of hours of work every week uh, for us because, as I mentioned before, my father used to work for this energy company, so we had a little unfair and, uh, market advantage about our competition because we told them, look, you don't sell any, uh, solar energy, but whenever one of your customers calling you wants to have solar energy, just tell them to call us. And um, so we had a customer acquisition cost of basically zero. Um, and the phone was ringing all the week, and my father was answering the phone. I was doing all the uh, uh, proposal preparation, etc. But it was really something we were able to do simply on the side. But this is really something I was not really passionate about, it was just business to survive. And since we were doing all this mobile technology and service stuff that I mentioned before already in the late, in the late 90s, just when the internet bubble uh, bursted and um, internet was over as the number one hype thing, the next big hype that was coming up um, on the horizon uh, was mobile technology, mobile infrastructure, mobile services. So, at one point, um, a guy that I got to know at one of these drinking parties at CBIT uh, called me and told me, look, we really want to expand our business uh, from email delivery infrastructure and technology uh, into mobile services and we want to set up an office uh, in Germany. Um, could you help us with that? And then, I said, yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't know why. I, I wanted to do this in Frankfurt. Today I hate Frankfurt, so I don't know why I ever had that idea. Like, yeah, let's do this in Frankfurt. So, no, we were thinking about Berlin. We have like two or three people there already hired for sales. Um, just go there for three months and have a look, like, a look at it. And um, if you then want to move into Frankfurt, we can still move into Frankfurt, but otherwise, let's just do it in Berlin. And so there were plenty of startups in Berlin at the time um, that all went essentially almost bankrupt or bankrupt. So there was a lot of space for very cheap money. So we found one company uh, in Berlin that has rented five floors like this uh, to start their business back in the day. And one of the f uh, five floors, they only supplied with entertainment. So you had like pool table and you had like soccer table and uh, you had video games. And they had like a 300 square meter floor full of toys. And uh, we were able to rent one of their, uh, one of their floors uh, very cheaply because they just tried to survive. And so this was essentially uh, some of the guys from, uh, from Italy because the company was originally from, uh, from Italy and the three guys that I mentioned that were hired in, um, in Germany to, to do sales. And I had a horrible fashion taste. I just see a white t-shirt under All right. Um, all right, maybe I still have a horrible fashion taste today, but uh, you probably easier can judge that easier 10 years later, right? So um, we set up shop, we built the office, we started to hire people. Um, history repeats, we had like a lot, of, um, a lot of people coming around. The office was growing very fast. Um, we had a sustainable and uh, sufficient business. This time, our clients were the big mobile 
operators and media companies that probably were not so much depending on venture capital as my clients and my first company. So I think everything was a bit more stable. <clears throat> but still some things look similar to uh, uh, the, years, the years before. And um, we invested a, uh, a lot into the team building and um, uh, the international management. So um, at, at the time, we started to have a lot of offices around, uh, around the world um, that uh, our company started. So every year, twice, we decided to take the top management of the company um, and just go for a couple of days in each of the new countries and cities that we, uh, that we opened. Uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, talks there and meetings with clients, uh, a lot of uh, uh, nice dinners and parties. Um, uh, that, uh, that were going on, so a similar picture to like the CBIT uh, thing. And <clears throat> the company used to grow insanely fast, so I really, uh, would say um, this was a very uh, lucky thing to happen. So Bongiorno was one of the last companies that raised venture capital in Europe. Um, we had the chance to be in a spot that was really uh, accelerating very fast. Uh, we had a lot of clients. Uh, we did, as I always call it, an Italian IPO uh, that was essentially buying a company that was undervalued, had some sort of assets uh, on the Italian stock market and renaming it after a year. So we didn't really go public, but it is perceived and published in the press as Mongiorno went public in that year. But what we really did was buying a company that was undervalued because the stock market was closed for new initial public offerings. So we grew the company and at a certain point in 2006, indicated by this little smiley over there, uh, that was based, uh, the peak of the, uh, of the company's uh, uh, stock value. Um, we decided, or that we, the founders of the company decided to acquire a competitor almost equal to size. So equal to size means at that time uh, we were roughly 700 employees worldwide. Uh, our competitor was around 600 employees uh, world, worldwide. And uh, 2006 was a market, uh, was a time where the markets in that space really started to stagnate. So it was the year before the iPhone, um, but still mobile services, mobile content, um, uh, all of that was really in a stagnating phase. And um, the acquisition price of our competitor uh, was, uh, I think, more or less five times the EBIT of our company that year, and most of the uh, uh, transaction was financed through loan by Italian bank. So it was a little bit too Italian for me, and uh, a little bit too Italian for a lot of other guys from the management, so we decided to leave the company. That's what the smiley is referred to. Um, more or less at that, uh, at that peak um, of the company. So. Fast forward, the company was bought two years ago from by entity Docomo for two euros, two euros a share. Um, and when I left the company, we were around five fish something. So I think um, for both my personal development and also from a monetary perspective, I think that was the best time uh, to, leave, to leave the company. So this time it didn't went into the wall. Um, this time it, um, it worked, went out well and worked great. The solar business by now, I had to sh shut down because the whole solar business was entirely depending on um, state regulations slash incentives. So uh, there was a law, or still is a law, uh, that you can sell the, the power that you generate. I don't know how, if, if there's something similar in Romania. If you put up solar panels on your roof of your house, your energy company slash the state is buying you the electricity for a certain price. And that went up and down, and they never really yeah, we're going to cancel this, no, we're going to not cancel this, and this created uh, chaos in the whole, in the whole market um, that people would have to pay for their um, solar cells and receive them one and a half year later because, later because companies totally reduced uh, their manufacturing and nobody was really willing to do it, so that was the point in time where we really stopped the business. Again, at the time it was a profitable business, we didn't have to invest into it, so I didn't lose anything from it but I also didn't make any more money with it. Um, so, referring to this thing going into the wall, um, I don't know, um, 
who knows the CTO of PayPal ever read this quote? I think there's not much to add, and I won't read it to you, so you probably can read it while I'm, uh, while I'm talking. Um, in, in my case, I mean, my agency was a nice business, it was okay, it didn't really work, work out well. Um, then the next company was great until it was shit, uh, and it didn't go anywhere. Um, the Zola business was kind of, kind of okay, and then for me, like the fourth thing I was really doing was something that really turned uh, turned out well. And that is not, I think, one specific example. I think this is more the rule than the exception. So let's talk a little bit more about failure. Um, failure and success. I think there is one fundamental uh, message to it, and that's why uh, I've written failure in big green characters, and success in small red ones. Um, it's essentially, failure is more or less the rule, and success is the, is the exception. And I always tell people, if you never fail in what you're trying to do, you never went outside of your boundaries, because if you only interact in between the things you know and that you can control, that you're capable of doing. You really have never tried anything new, extraordinary, high goal uh, thing. So failure is an essential part on your journey of doing something, something successful. And I think this is something um, in society, I don't know what's the state of discussion about failure in society here, but in Germany it's even something that the government has recently picked up on a conversation about uh, uh, technology startups, industrialization, etc. Uh, what is important for the, for the future. And I have another good news for you that there's a secret formula behind failure. So everybody of you knows the return of investment, but have you heard about the return of failure? So the return of failure, uh, for me personally, I wouldn't be here literally on this stage uh, if, if it wouldn't be for all my failures, obviously. Um, and I think if you starting a career as an entrepreneur and you will look back 10, 15 years later, you will figure out that the failures uh, that happened in your life were the most crucial things happening to you. And out of that, you gained the most out of it. So success probably pays off in very monetary, monetary uh, terms, uh, but failure, if you, if you digest it and you think about it, really helps you to, to think about it in a, uh, in a broader sense. So uh, you will have a lot of benefits out of it. During when you started something new, you try to go out of your boundaries, you have met new people, you've done new things, you learned new things. Um, all of that essentially uh, you pay for with your money and your time. So it's just a question, was that money and time allocated properly uh, during, uh, during, this, uh, during these days, years, months? Uh, decades, maybe. <clears throat> and so a friend of mine, very famous European entrepreneur, who has heard about Martin Wysowski? Oh, well, great. So this guy has built from scratch two companies which he each sold for over a billion euros in the last 15 years, all in technology. Um, he's also a lecturer at um, Columbia University um, uh, in New York about uh, uh, entrepreneurship, and um, he's been perceived as uh, a key advisor to a lot of companies. He just joined the board of the largest German uh, publishing house. He was invited to uh, Deutsche Telekom's management uh, board uh, uh, once or twice a year um, for, for different trends and, and technologies. And if you talk to him, like, yeah, you know, a couple of things that I did in my life didn't work out so well, so he did one company in Berlin, in Germany, um, uh, called Einstein, that I think was 35 or 50 million euros of his own money he lost, but before he sold the company for a billion, so that's a different kind of magnitude, but still it shows um, uh, the, very, the very high commitment. There's also another uh, great example of an um, uh, entrepreneur in, in Denmark called Morten Lund. Who knows Morten Lund? Nobody? Great. Um, so this guy has started uh, a bunch of companies, um, uh, made tens of millions of euros, um, put all that money in one endeavor, buying 
a free newspaper in Denmark. And everybody was like, are you nuts? I mean, you're doing all this technology uh, companies and services. Why, for Christ's sake, would you buy a newspaper? Apparently, everyone who told him he's nuts uh, turned out to be right. So he has borrowed a lot of money, brought in a lot of investors um, to make this thing work, and it didn't. And so he had to uh, file uh, insolvency on a private level. So he just, I think, last year came out of this phase of being um, uh, insolvent on a, on a private level. Um, but he's been helping to start a lot of interesting business over, over that period of time again, and he's already back in the business uh, uh, big time. Because he always um, believed in um, the, the adoption of technology and the change that comes comes with it, and he's a great speaker. So I, I will, I've been on a conference once uh, um, where he had to really get the crowd crowd going, so he can really um, get people in, um, to move and to do uh, and to do things. And um, so there are many many more examples. I have one talk that I, that I do like the ten most important examples of, of something like this. And I can talk a bit more about my personal experience. So since 2007, I've been primarily investing money into, into startups. And more or less, one third of the companies that I've invested in go into the wall. There's no way I would ever recover, uh, recover that money. And that is just a snapshot, snapshot of today. So still, maybe some companies I've been working with will fail eventually. I would be happy to keep up only that rate, but still, it means every third shot that I, uh, I took um, uh, goes into nowhere. And if you only if you're really willing to do uh, to do something like that, uh, that will bring you uh, to another to another level. I mean, imagine you in your daily daily uh, job, and you have three projects on the table, um, and you will do all of three of them, but you know already from the beginning. That one of them, everything you put into it, your resources, your company's resources, uh, will go to hell. I would think that most of the people, especially if you work in a large corporation, is not willing to do uh, to do something like this because you're trying to not fail. You're trying to stay on the successful path. You're trying to do only the things that you know for sure that will work. And if you're trying to do only that, you will never innovate and never go into uh, a space where you will be able to discover discovering new things. You will only maintain the status quo. So I do this kind of talk on a couple of, uh, couple of different occasions. Um, uh, I do really a lot of mentoring and coaching for a lot of startups on different conferences and events um, because to have this vision of saying we're going to try something new, we're going to, uh, not going crazy and do something we have no idea of how to control it, but really going, going beyond, beyond your boundaries is something that uh, I put a lot of my time uh, a lot of my time to. But most importantly, if you're trying to do something like that, I think it's important that you, uh, that you set yourself uh, uh, some goals. So um, I think this quote really uh, nails it very, very well. You have to really set a goal in what you want to achieve in order to be able to, to do it. If you're just floating in Whatever you, you do, uh, you will never uh, never go any uh, anywhere. And my personal goal is that I would like to help a hundred people in my life to start successfully in business. So it took me quite some uh, quite some time um, to really think of a broader sense. Of course, in every single project and every single uh, endeavor I'm involved in and working with, uh, I sort of have. Uh, smaller goals, but the overall goal for, for me is when people always say, yeah, but why do you actually do this? So I do a lot of work on, on different universities and I, why do you spend 30 days a year on universities? Why do you go to all these workshops? Why do you go to Romania and talk on a... Oh. It's like, really, I want to help people and encourage people to, uh, to start a business and really trying to be involved in, in helping them to do that. Which is basically putting into words like this. Um, so, a quick path through the lessons uh, that, uh, that I have learned um, through, through this journey um, is that it's really important to, to imagine um, that 
I don't know how new this is for you, but the first time I've been in the Silicon Valley, which is maybe eight years ago or so, at the Stanford campus, there was a bus going around with Wi-Fi on board. I was like, this is crazy. I would have never imagined this, uh, that this would work. Today it's like, yeah, okay, there's a bus, there's Wi-Fi on board. Or if I sit in a plane where it's Wi-Fi and it doesn't work, the guy beside me tells me, this is shit, this is so slow, it doesn't work. And I'm like, man, I mean, there's a great comedian, Louis C.K., I don't know, you know, he has exactly this quote, quote is like, dude, I mean, you're sitting in a chair in the sky, and I mean, you're participating in a miracle of flying, it's really, and then you complain about Wi-Fi on board, it's really insane. Um, it's important to, uh, uh, to also dream, I mean, my parents would still call me I'm a dreamer. Uh, when I started my business uh, at, uh, at 17, uh, everybody was saying, internet, really? I mean, don't you want to do something real in life? Isn't that just uh, an, a thing that will go over? And I think it's important to think, to think big. So if you're ever going to see in your company, in your business, this room, that's great. <laughs> Anyone knows what that room is? That's the boardroom where you're going to have breakfast on the New York Stock Exchange on the IPO day. So uh, that, that's, a, uh, that's a good one. So just to grab things and make, make things happen. I mean, even our big company where we had so many employees, even if it's a sad story, I mean, I went, was the one who went to the stores and just bought IT infrastructure if it was needed until I was waiting for anyone else to do it. Um, Hiring smart. I think there is a couple of, um, you know, of interesting lessons. So, everyone I hired, I was never looking at their university degrees because, first of all, I never studied, so I have no idea what all these kind of studies that you can take mean to your life and what you actually learn. Um, but essentially, for me, it was how is this person engaged in what they're going to do, and how committed um, are they behind this? And um, just trying to pick one. A uh, specific example. So there was one guy I had to hire, or I wanted to hire, and he was still serving the German military for another three or four months. And he was having otherwise the right mindset, the right education, and I really believe that this is the guy for the position because we want to grow fast, we need to have young people willing to learn, having some uh, skills already that are crucial for doing what we want to do. So I told him, look, you're great for this position, but I need you on the first of next month. There's no way, otherwise you, uh, uh, you'll be able to get that job. And so what he did, uh, he went back to, uh, to the military and went to the boss of his boss and told him, look, I know I have three or four more months to serve the military, but I have this job opportunity. If I don't get this, I will be without a job after I leave the military, and you guys will be responsible for that. And um, so the boss of his boss went to his boss and told him, look, you have to make this guy leave. He really has this great opportunity. So he really put all the efforts in where everyone else was at, hey, look, I'm still in the military. I cannot leave three, three to four more months. There's no way I will get out of there. I mean, it's always easier to maintain the status quo than uh, going, uh, going through, um, uh, through all of this kind of discussion. So this was for me essentially the last point to really figure out that this guy has the, has the right mindset because the people I had to hire was people who think around the corner and not really trying to do everything after the protocol. And there are a lot of more stories about this in the hiring experience, so I think I hired probably 60, 80, more, more like 80 people um, uh, over time, uh, many of them being directly reporting to me but also for the, for the teams that I that have set, uh, set up. I think it's always also important um, to meet smart people. Um, so Martin that I mentioned before, um, I only got to know because I looked up where other conferences he's going to. I really tried to approach him, uh, try to find people that we know in common, get to reference to it, because I really want to uh, get to know the guy. Um, and um, this I think is, is something really, uh, really important because a lot of great guys um, uh, that, I, that I know and I'm in regular contact with and I'm thinking about different kind of businesses that I'm starting with. Um, it's not that they just run over me on the street and I was like, hey, this is great to meet you. 
I was really trying to find my way to um, uh, to get contact contact with him. Um, and uh, who knows the guy on the right side? I mean, the guy on the left side is pretty simple. That's Tim Ferriss, right? You know, four-hour work week. Uh, look, I was. I think it's it's very inspiring, but going beyond what is acceptable book, because I would never outsource the relationship management with my parents. He does. Um, but uh, it was really, really uh, inspiring talking to this, uh, to this guy. Um, sharing ideas, I think it's no way it's going to be successful if you're going to sit in your basement and do what you do and think like, if I talk to someone else, he's going to steal my idea. This is the, probably the worst thing to, to do. Um, if you go out, talk to, talk to people, like I just mentioned, really uh, respected uh, people in a certain field, experts, uh, this is what get, gets you going, this is what keeps you on track, this is what helps you, especially avoiding mistakes. So a lot of people turn to me when I do this mentoring and coaching uh, uh, activities and talk, talk with me about their ideas. It's not that my opinion is the best one in the world, no way, but it's, it's, a, it's an opinion, it's a perspective on things based on certain experiences that I, uh, that I made. And I think it's very crucial that for whatever you do, very much from the beginning, you really think about uh, your, your USP of whatever you're trying to, uh, trying to set up. Because otherwise, you will have no passion on the long run why you're actually doing, uh, doing this. I mean, there are a couple of successful businesses uh, out there that are just number driven and people just started because it's a great business. But I think most of the times when something really goes wrong, you only stay on it because you're really passionate about it, and that's really when you know why you're actually doing this. Then it's very important that you fail fast and fail cheap. That also goes hand in hand with talking about your idea with other people. If you figure out after the third conversation, probably none of your potential customers will ever buy something uh, from you. It's probably a shitty idea. So, and there's, there are certain ways a lot of ways uh, to do it. When I lecture at university um, in a two weeks program, I, I, at one specific day in these two weeks, I sent them out to local coffee shops um, and tell them, look, whenever a customer walks in, into the place that looks like your potential customer you want to sell something to, approach them, tell them you buy them a coffee, and in return, they will answer you a couple of questions. In this way, within one day, you have 20, 30, 40 people that you consider your key customers figuring out if they really would like to buy such a service and are willing to pay for it, what you're trying to, trying to set up. The cost of that is 30 to 40 coffees. You don't have to invest any money into it to set up a business, to hire people, um, and it helps even in the two weeks program at, uh, at the university with students to really validate their ideas and work on, uh, uh, work on them. Then, most importantly, change happens. I mean, what I mentioned before with the Wi-Fi in the, uh, in, the, in the bus, I believe that everything that we have today in a technology perspective will go through another phase of iteration in the next, in the next 10 years. And that was true for the last 10 years, and was also true for the 10 years before. So whenever you believe that something today is the status quo, I mean, 10 years ago, there was not even a smartphone in the market. There was like one Sony Ericsson thing, which was super expensive, nobody really used. But since then, this entirely changed the way we, we interact, we communicate. Uh, I see a lot of people playing with their phones right now. So um, all of this will always move, move, move forward and uh, will never uh, stand, uh, stand, stand still. Um, you're going to lose sometimes but you also going to win the world championship sometimes. Um, and when something goes wrong, I would always think about trying to turn this into an opportunity. It's always very simple to say, but really if you analyze things and figure out why it didn't work, instead of complaining about that it didn't work, which probably consumes the same amount of time and energy, uh, you probably will find a way how to, uh, how to make it work uh, the, the next time. Also very important is to take a break. I think the best, the best ideas um, and uh, advancements in, um, in things I was working on uh, was actually really 
when I took a break. And this is really simple to say, and it's also very hard to implement, but it's really, really critical um, uh, to, do, to do so. Because if you're running in your hamster wheel all day, every day, you will never have the distance to look at things from a, from a creative perspective. Particularly if you start a business and you're running an operation with a lot of people involved, it's really important that you, uh, that you do that. And most importantly, if you really want to start a business, it's you who's going to make a difference. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I don't know how much more time we have left. Thanks, Benjamin. If there are any questions, for Benjamin. If not, I... Oh, okay. Hey. Um, just wonder, where are you with those 100 people that you're trying to get to success and how do you actually count the plus one? How do you know to count the plus one? How count to plus one? Yes. To add one more? Yeah, no, when do you know that you actually help someone to have a success? Ah, right. So, uh, I mentioned to start successfully in business. I mean, not making it a successful business. I think that would require, just by pure statistics, probably a thousand people to be engaged with. Um, deeply involved. Um, so there, I would say there is a direct and indirect way to count it. So the direct way would be the companies that I've invested into. That's 15. An indirect way is of, okay, how many mentoring relationships um, I've been encountering over, over time. That would be like the indirect number of it. And I think out of that, there's another 20 to 25 over the last couple of years. So just two weeks ago at the conference in Vienna, I bumped into two guys. The faces were familiar. I have met them two years ago in a mentoring session that I did in a startup program. I didn't remember their names, and they're like, hey, Benjamin, hi, good to meet you. You were the first person we turned to back in the days with our idea, and your advice was totally right. It was a completely shitty idea. We turned it into something new. We went to Startup Chile. We just spent a couple of months there. We turned this idea into the direction that you said to us. And now it's working great. We're now back in Vienna. I said, hey, that's great. Plus one. <laughs> um, so that's basically the way how to, to count it. Very good insights. Just one question about the failure. So um, I was thinking to try to, I mean, I guess you try to identify where that comes from. I mean, I think it's a, it's a peak, yeah? And there, if you don't think about the failure, then you for sure will fail. So which is the perfect moment to do a change in order to, let's say, postpone the failure? Because eventually it will come back. I mean, I was thinking that the growth peak there, or? Well, for me, essentially, it was always, I tried until it went, goes into the wall. So, um, it's probably not a very satisfying uh, answer, but um, I think, eventually, I mean, you will try a couple of times, and sooner or later, latest in the moment when I started to lose the passion for it, like, okay, really, now I tried everything, I tried this, I tried that, I tried this, and all of it that, that doesn't work, I really have to make a hard cut here and stop it. Like it was a very simple one with this company where we put all our money back, and I said, okay, if I look at my personal private budget in August, I will be out of money. This is the moment I have to stop. Um, that's very much true if you start your business, start your startup, um, and you have some money um, to start it. Uh, you will figure out a day where you will be out of money. That's a very good indicator on which you should basically stop. Um, but also in terms of, of iteration, I mean, a couple of businesses that we tried to turn around and make it work, um, like with our company before I left it, we identified a couple of different uh, businesses and made some assumptions um, that we should move the business into. And when we tried to validate them, and most of the metrics that we assumed to be true didn't work out, we moved on to the next to the next opportunity to try to make this work. And still, in the end, we found something that worked, but didn't work out the way we wanted to do. So for me, ultimately, was the point that I leave the business 
as it is, but I find something something else to uh, to do. Does it answer the question? Okay. Hey Benjamin, um, good presentation, thumbs up, very good, clear message. Um, given your expertise right now with uh, mentoring all the startups, what is the most common mistake that you see nowadays with the young entrepreneurs? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think that in time of, of these, in particular if you're talking about technology uh, and entrepreneurship, uh, it is so simple to reach a point where you uh, are able to validate your basic assumptions before you start uh, speaking with potential investors in, um, uh, to finance and grow your business. So I think um, a key mistake is to spending too much money on the wrong thing, uh, too much time and money on the wrong thing. So spending too much time on the wrong thing in particular is when you're in a stage where you should bring your company to a, a phase where you can show that your business is working, spending all your time as the CEO of the company trying to raise outside funds. In this, in this phase, I've seen a lot of potentially good businesses fail because they entirely focus their management attention into trying to find uh, uh, future, future investors rather than starting to develop uh, a business uh, proposition per se because most of the people don't have the understanding of that it's also okay if you have a company that is working somehow but doesn't necessarily need to be a VC or business angel investment case. So you still can have a company that is making money to pay two or three people and that's great. You can always go out afterwards and try to scale the business and raise, raise more money. But to bring it to a, a level where you at least show that your business is working, uh, this is I think where people uh, essentially spend a lot of uh, time in, different, uh, in a different, different way. And also trying to set the wrong kind of metrics. So I think it's always very good if you find a mentor or a coach in uh, that specific industry and space you're trying to go in to identify really what are the key metrics that are relevant for business in, uh, in that space. Because many times I've seen companies that um, put their key metrics as like how many people visit their website or how many likes they have on a Facebook page. I don't care about how many likes you have on your Facebook page, how many people are willing to buy your service, your product, uh, uh, whatsoever. That's a very simple one, but there are more you know, more technology-oriented uh, technology things. Uh, there are much more relevant metrics to that, and I think uh, that's a very simple thing to <coughs> engage with in a very early stage of your company to avoid going into the wrong direction. Thank you very much. Benjamin, I think you'll be available during the break if anyone still wants to talk to you. Thanks again. Sure. Thank you.